From the home studios of the Teaching Systems Lab at MIT, this is Teach Lab, a podcast about the art and craft of teaching. I'm Justin Reich. Today we have Barbara Means. Barbara Means is the Executive Director of Learning Science Research at Digital Promise, and she's the author of Learning Online, um, one of the great summaries of online and blended learning research from the past decade. Uh, Barbara, thanks for joining us on Teach Lab. Oh, well, thank you so much, Justin. It's really a pleasure. Uh, for us to be able to get to know you, can you give us your ed tech story? What was the, what was the earliest, most uh, significant encounter that you had with learning technologies um, that maybe planted the seed of interest that led you to where you are now? Boy, you're asking me to go back to the dark ages now. The dark ages, that's what we want to do. <laughs> okay, uh, pre-internet. Um, I would say the thing that got me interested in educational technology, probably a couple of events, and I think they're both still relevant today. One was I happened to be working for a nonprofit research organization that uh, did work with the armed services. This is way back in the 80s. And we had a project with the Air Force uh, Human Resources Lab to study the parts of jobs for enlisted people that were really essentially problem solving, the things you couldn't automate. Mm -hmm. So their vision was, we're automating the things you can automate, but these things that are really uh, much more conceptual, we can't automate, and we need to be able to train people to do those things better. So we worked at that time, I had a contract and worked with uh, Learning Resource Research and Development Center at uh, Pitt and with Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, a nonprofit working in this space at the time. And we were working on intelligent tutoring systems. So my collaborators brought those in. And when you saw what people could do in terms of learning how to troubleshoot uh, an F-16 jet engine and that they could learn as much in six months using the simulation in this intelligent tutoring system. These were Lisp tutors way back when for any Lisp old timers. Lisp a programming language that would be a little bit like Fortran or other, you know, that, that vintage anyway. That vintage. And at the time we thought the, you know, it couldn't be intelligent unless it was written in Lisp. Um, but seeing how powerful that was, that really impressed me. And then I guess you flash forward some years later, I really became interested in how technology, not really for its own sake, but it actually makes people think about uh, what am I teaching? Mm. What is it I hope people learn and can do? And how do I structure a learning experience that works for them? And so in a way, technology is an invitation, whether it's for a curriculum designer, a teacher, a school leader, to really re rethink what they're doing, uh, how they organize it, how they measure it, and what the experience is like for students. And uh, seeing that happen in schools as I was studying early introductions of technology into schools uh, for the Department of Education really got me interested in the potential learning impacts uh, for people who otherwise wouldn't have uh, high quality learning experiences. And also I think just learning technology adoption is if you will, kind of the, um, some like people a catalyzing call it the, event. The, the, yeah. I like that better than the Trojan horse, which actually is bringing bad things. So right, the right, catalyzing right, right. event, exactly. But the, but the Trojan horse metaphor is something like you're what it looks like you're putting the technology in, but you're actually trying to sneak in pedagogy. You're trying to sneak in organizational ideas. You're trying to sneak in all other kinds of ideas and change in change that people let in through the walls. Cause they go, Oh, look at this gift yeah, that we've been exactly. given um, in the device. Um, yeah. Right. I think, I, I think there's something to the Trojan horse metaphor. I mean, that certainly resonates quite a bit with me that, you know, that the learning technologies themselves can be interesting, but re what's really interesting is the, you know, it maybe it's not completely unique, but it, but a striking way in which communities of faculty and educators are willing to, at, at least for a period, kind of rethink their practices in the face of this sort of symbol of the future. You know, here's this shiny new laptop, here's this shiny new device. We don't know exactly what it can do yet, but we're willing to relax some of our assumptions about what the future should look like in order to, to spread our imagination here. That's right. And it often, you know, it's 
one thing, there's no, uh, there's no shame in saying, I don't know how to use this new technology. Uh, and the other thing, it often brings educators together who don't usually work together. That's one of the things we see in a lot of our work with various institutions. So suddenly you're team teaching or you're working with somebody who's an instructional designer that you normally wouldn't work with, but that instructional designer knows how to use the technology. Yep, bringing bringing different kinds of people with different kinds of expertise together. So, w tell us a little bit about what, you, what you're working on most recently, because I know some of your recent research is focused on responses to COVID. Um, what what are what are you studying, and what are you finding um, that educators might find helpful right now? Uh, yes, we are. We have been looking at COVID, and uh, much of this has been at the undergraduate level. We did a survey in May of a nationally representative sample of over a thousand students who had been taking a college course for credit that had in-person class meetings before COVID and then had to go entirely remote. And so we wanted to find out about the challenges they were facing, how common those challenges were and uh, how widespread they were for different kinds of students. We also wanted to find out what experiences they were having in their courses, that is what their instructors were doing and what their reaction was to um, to those things. And there's so little that we, I mean, there's so little that we know about that even in normal times. You know, right. one of the things that sort of struck me, you know, my earliest days as an education researcher is you'd, you'd come up with a question like, well, how many times do students talk during a typical class period in a social studies class. And we just have no idea, you know, we, we have so little understanding of what typical classroom practice looks like um, in any kind of granular way, because it's because it's so diffuse. Um, and so, you know, um, it sounds like you really found a way of targeting these students who are sort of stuck in this emergency pivot who happen to be there for this moment. Um, what, did, what did you find out about their experiences and their responses that, that seems most important to you now? Well, one of the things uh, that really hit me was when we asked them about what challenges they experienced, um, by far and away, the biggest one, the most commonly reported as a major problem for them was maintaining motivation mm. for the course. And we asked them to describe the challenge first and then categorize it. And as we read the descriptions, uh, a couple of things really hit home. Uh, one was that the loss of a routine was really hard for people. And this is apart from some other real challenges, like having conflicts with a job you had to get to put food on the table or conflicts with family or childcare responsibilities. But just simply loss of that routine, students described it being hard to get out of bed or hard to make yourself go and get online uh, and do work on your course. So that was one thing. The other thing that really came through was there was definitely a social aspect to this. I, I was somewhat surprised how much undergraduate students reported missing contact with their instructor, mm. not being able to talk to my instructor, not being able to get an answer from my instructor right away, feeling at a distance from their instructor and their peers. They also described missing their peers, which was less of a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> So that was on the challenge side. What I was, um, what I was surprised by on the side of in terms of practices and what they experienced. Um, you, there, of course, was a great variation in how much, uh, what in what kind of instruction they experienced, and in whether it was just a matter of posting materials online for students to complete and then taking some online exams or whether there actually were uh, Zoom sessions for smaller courses or other kinds of synchronous instruction. Uh, but the interesting thing was when we asked them about a set of practices that we took because they're generally known to be uh, correlated with uh, student satisfaction and or learning in courses, um, 
those courses for which the students said there was a higher number of these practices used, they also, the students were also much more satisfied with their learning in those. And what, what are some examples of those kinds of well-known practices? Well, the three that turned out to be the most influential, the first one was using real life examples to illustrate the course content. Mm -hmm. So having the instructor actually bring it to something that comes from the real world. And of course you don't need, you know, I mean, you do that offline, not just online, but you can do it before often, a pandemic, you can do it during a pandemic, just good. Yes, teaching. It's just good. It's just good teaching. Um, but some students did complain or, or did observe that there was less use of, real life examples during the pandemic than before. And in part, that was probably because instructional time was truncated. And the instructor felt, okay, I've got to keep moving through the curriculum. Yeah, yep. I got to hit the, hit the core pieces, do, yeah. do the formulas, skip the application. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Anyway, so use of those real world applications were really important. The second one was getting personal messages from the instructor. Mm -hmm. So speaking to that interpersonal piece, and so um, getting those messages, they could have been, are you doing, you know, are you okay? Yep. Are you, you know, are you um, in good health? Um, also about, do you have access to what you need in order to get online? Um, and just, um, you know, I notice you're falling behind. Is there anything I can do to help you? And so, instructors so often use those strategies in, in an in-person setting, you can use those things kind of informally. You can be like, I, you know, I know I got to catch this student and I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to come to class 10 minutes early and, or I'll stay a little bit late mm -hmm. and I'll just grab this person as part of my kind of normal teaching routine. Whereas to make those, you know, and you can do it in class, people mm -hmm. are working on something and you can wander the aisles and touch base mm -hmm. with them and things like that. Whereas to, to some extent, if you want to do that work in a fully online setting, it's got to be a little bit more deliberate. I've got to, you know, send that email or send that message to Barbara and say, hey, mm -hmm. can we take five minutes to talk? I just want to check in those kinds of things. So it has, it, it, it can happen in both places, but, but it's, I think I, my sense is it's much easier to do kind of informally in person and it really has to be part of a structured routine on uh, online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's right. And I think normally it just is kind of emergent in the in-person setting. Now there are technology tools that can help you do this and systems that can um, identify students that are not participating and that can even set up the emails for you that they may look personal to the student, but in, in fact, the emails that have, uh, you've been given a shell for the email that you can yep. customize as you like. Um, and we know some faculty members use those. And, um, and then the third thing, which I thought was interesting was, um, Courses where there were uh, there were assignments or activities that called for the student to reflect on her own learning. Mm -hmm. What is it you understand? What don't you understand? And so those were the three practices that had the strongest relationship with satisfaction with students learning and with the course in general. Good. So, so good, good teaching practices to be done at any time, um, but particularly important now. I mean, all the things you're saying resonate. We did a study in our lab where we interviewed 40 K-12 teachers across the country, um, you know, public, private, uh, independent, math, science, social studies, PE, music, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, we, it wasn't nationally representative, but we got a group that was, that was pretty wide ranging. Um, and certainly student motivation was the the top of their concerns, along with co connectivity in, in K-12. But mm -hmm. uh, um, that sense of how do we keep folks connected? Um, I'll tell you, know, the other thing that you're and that report was called What's Lost, What's Left, What's Next. And we can put both mm -hmm. of these things in the in the show notes. Um, but another thing that your your comments, especially about the importance of connecting with instructors, um, make me think of is I in March. If you had mm -hmm. asked me what colleges should do um, to make it through the rest of the semester, I would have said something like, you know, in a lot of cases, people have spent a lot of money building online courses in the most common topics that are taught in higher mm -hmm. education. And instead of trying to, in the midst of a pandemic with two kids running around your feet, trying to whip together some Zoom class, 
you should just probably point people to what's ever on OpenStax or Coursera mm -hmm. or FedEx um, and say, go have at it and then come back and meet me once a week and we'll talk about what you're learning. Um, I was I was surprised at how little my perception is that happened. Um, mm -hmm. And I have the sense that that there was no widespread student demand. I didn't. I, I I've heard nowhere where there are groups of students saying, "Why do we have to take these lousy courses that our that our instructors are whipping up out of nowhere when there's better materials available elsewhere?" And instead, teachers saying, uh, students saying, "No, I still want my version of mm -hmm. microeconomics taught to me by my professor in my little university, whatever that happens to be." Does that, does that resonate for you? Is, uh... Oh, that, that really resonates with me. I remember actually one student's comment was, and they were lauding their professor because they said, um, instead of showing us videos of other people teaching the topic, she recorded herself doing it. Right, right. And these other videos might have cost thousands of dollars for someone to put together. They might have been much better, but right. that student wants her professor. I think that's I think that's exactly right, and it really it really again points to this personal relationship aspect of teaching and learning that seems to be so important for maintaining motivation. Um, you know, we did hear there were quite a few universities that, for equity reasons, um, told their instructors uh, don't do any synchronous instruction mm -hmm. in the spring, just uh, put everything online and let students do it asynchronously, that is on their own time whenever they wanted. Um, we found that when there were no synchronous sessions, <clears throat> which could have been either with the professor or it could have been a, it could have been online office hours or it could have been working with a teaching assistant, uh, in a section, but if there were no synchronous sessions, the students were less happy with their course and their learning. So they really wanted that connection with a real person, just like many of us do. You know, you ever you call up customer service, and it's so frustrating. Even if after the fifth click you can get to what you want, you just want to say, "I want a real person to talk to me and tell me they're sorry." <laughs> and from from you know for. For people who are sort of immersed in the research on instructional design, this emphasis on the synchronous during the pandemic is a little bit odd um, because, in fact, I think many instructional design frameworks for people who are opting in to online learning, online college courses would say, yeah, there, there are a lot of good reasons to use things that aren't anchored to time. People work at different times. They live in different parts of the world. Um, get, you know, that, that, over, that we should, generally speaking, be creating mostly asynchronous curriculum, certainly with synchronous meetings kind of woven in, but kind of the heart of the experience should be a lot. I mean, I feel like when I was following instructional design Twitter in March and April, you know, folks were saying, why are we doing all this synchronous stuff? Like, we, you know, we know that asynchronous can work really well. Um, but to me, there's sort of a signal there that like asynchronous can work really well when you've opted into it, when you've chosen it, when you sort of knew what you were up against um, and could could prepare yourself to thread that approach to learning in your life. Um, by contrast, you know, if sort of the rug gets pulled out from you and your in-person school just stops, then you want something that's close to that, which is, you know, e which is crummy Zoom school ends up being, you know, more desirable in some ways than even the best, most well-prepared asynchronous materials. Now, one of the things we did find, we also did case studies. We've been working with uh, colleges and universities that serve large numbers of low-income students and students of color. Um, we've been working with them on attempts to uh, redesign and improve their introductory gateway courses incorporating digital learning, typically adaptive courseware. So that's, you know, courseware that professional instructional designers developed and has some of the kinds of features you're talking about. But typically that's just a part of the course. So there's also um, before COVID, there would be face-to-face -face classes plus work that's done on the courseware. And and this is a research project that you had started pre-COVID, but just right. happened, you just happened to be running it and the pandemic hits. Exactly. And so you're thinking about how to adapt. Yeah, yeah. And we're continuing now. So we're working with some of the same institutions as they go into this fall kind of uh, 
strange semester that we're in now. But one of the things we did find is that those, um, those instructors that had already done this and had some use, uh, some asynchronous use of professionally designed instructional materials that was part of their course and had built up kind of routines and patterns before COVID, the transition was much easier for them and mm. their students. Yep. Yep. Because there were parts of the course that could carry over that were resilient to this kind of disruption. And there were many fewer things they had to figure out, you know, how to do in this new medium. If you if you already have a kind of blended routine going that when you lose the in-person, you've got more of that online stuff to kind of rest on to go back to. You know, I can even imagine, I, did you, let me know if you saw this, that, that some of those instructors might have said, like during those, those terrible weeks in March when everyone is scrambling, um, you know, I could imagine saying to my students, just keep doing this online part for like a week or 10 days or something like that. And I'm going to put together something that works for the synchronous piece. But you could mm -hmm. almost like really lean in to the asynchronous online routines mm -hmm. like just for like, you know, a week and a half so that I can get my act together. Um, right. did, did you see patterns like that emerge or? Um, I think we, yeah, in a sense we did. I didn't hear anyone say it as explicitly as you did, mm -hmm. but we did see that they kept those routines up. Um, they were sometimes, uh, there were many cases where instructors were a little more flexible on deadlines for completion than they had been before, but they tried to keep the same schedule. It was typically yep. um, maybe a flipped classroom kind of situation where students reviewed materials before coming to a synchronous session. It used to be in class. Now the synchronous session is online. Yep. Well, you, you know, pre-COVID, if you had said, what are the best ways to improve gateway classes for um, for students in community colleges or state colleges um, to to help improve their persistence? You know, online learning, blended learning is one reasonable option, but it's not the sort of in my view, it's not the dispositively obvious option. You know, right, there are other right. things that you could choose um, about you know better advising, better coaching, you know, more active learning in classrooms and things like that. Um, so you know, uh, online blended learning, it's like a, a promising thing to try, but not the one obvious thing to do. Right. Um, but it does strike me that in a world of growing climate change, this is not going to be the, the only pandemic that we face in our lifetimes, very likely. Um, we're going to continue to see more interrupted schooling from fires, from extreme weather events, for other kinds of things that schools just are going to find that they have to become more robust to more frequent interruptions. Right. Um, and that may require school, you know, for, for the reasons that you just said, it's, you know, it's not that blended learning is the number one best way to make schooling better. But if you know that school is going to be interrupted a lot, having everyone have some experience and some practice with those routines is awfully helpful. Right. Argument right. Resonate for you? Yeah, no, I agree with that entirely. I, I do think that the um, if you will, the the secret ingredient, the biggest secret ingredient, I think, is around the active learning and trying to have uh, more active learning in synchronous time, as well as hopefully as courseware improves, there'll be really more active learning within that as well. And, and active I, learning here defined as not just lecturing to students, but interspersing lectures with turn and talk activities, with reflection activities, with peer teaching activities, is sort of, uh, is that how you define it? Sort of a whole exactly. range of things that break up teacher talk and force students to articulate their thinking to themselves or to each other. That's right, exactly. And, and to attempt to apply ideas in uh, applications and in different uh, situations. Um, and I think those, those techniques are really important. And as we can, perhaps offload some of the just transmitting information to some of the um, digital learning systems and to time outside of uh, synchronous time, I think we can have a more constructive use of those precious minutes when students and instructors are actually together. So um, in Failure to Disrupt, one of the things that I try to teach readers a bit about is this idea of meta-analysis. Um, mm -hmm. The idea that it's really hard 
from any individual study to make educational claims. Um, and um, the way that knowledge moves forward in sciences and the way that we should think about applying science about learning and education to our work in schools is, you know, ideally by waiting till we have lots of studies done and can kind of sum up um, the what we learn from all of them. Um, and certainly, you know, one of the most important meta-analyses about online learning um, in the last uh, 10 or 20 years comes from you. Um, you know, I think originally published for the Institute of Education Sciences in 2010, correct me if I'm wrong there, and then republished and expanded as a book called Learning Online in 2014. Um, you know, you've had lots of contributions to the field of learning science, but this is really like a signature one that many people have come back to um, where you um, took all of the really rigorous studies that you could find about on that compared online and blended learning or online and face to face learning and blended and face to face learning. Um, and the and the summary that that you point towards there um, is that in a lot of these research studies that were done, um, the um, we find little differences in outcomes between online learning and face to face learning, and sometimes that we find that blended learning has outcomes that's like a little bit better than just online learning, maybe a little bit better than just face to face learning. Is is that is that a fair summary? Of, of the argument that you made in 2010 and 2014? Um, I think that's a fair summary. The only thing I would add is, uh, you know, we did find that blended learning on average was better than face-to-face, -face, but we also found that in most of the studies going into the meta-analysis, there really was a difference other than the modality. Mm -hmm. Um, that is, if you really had what uh, an economist or some other methodologist might consider the purest study, you know, the Richard Clark study, where everything is exactly the same, only one is entirely face to face and the other is blended. Um, I would argue it's probably an impossible dream, but if you really could do that, you probably wouldn't find a difference. Any difference at all. That part of what's happening in the blended learning is that you're having some other instructional improvement. You're having more time, more active learning, something else better that's happening. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the improvement probably, uh, that's likely where the improvement uh, comes from, would be my bet. Nevertheless, I, I remain, and I, I think the book is pretty positive about blended learning as an approach, and I remain positive about it. Certainly, the COVID experience has um, added, I guess, another reason to be positive about blended learning as an approach. I do think it gives you more resilience. Mm -hmm. It can and give you... Just we're talking about. We just finished talking about. Um, it can give the student... Uh, multiple ways to learn uh, the same objective because it's explained in different ways. You can keep that personal connection with an instructor when you've got blend rather than fully online. It's easier to have that personal touch. Um, but you can also get some of the benefits of more sophisticated renderings of things like uh, molecular structures or complex systems or going back and forth between um, equations and uh, videotaped movement. Um, so I, I, I see blended learning as actually something I think is going to continue to grow and I think has promise. So I'm a little more upbeat about that than perhaps your summary was. Good. Yeah, that's that's great. That's a great clarification that the that the that the book is learning online, but the, but certainly a theme in the book is like let's really look at this blended stuff and maybe some of that has grown in your thinking. Um I mean, you know, this work as I was coming up as a um as someone studying education technology was very influential to me. Um one thing that I have perceived and I think you even see this come out during covid times um is is one interpretation of that work is folks saying, well, we know that online learning can be just as good as in-campus learning. Um, so we, we don't have to worry too much about, we don't have to worry about connectivity issues, but we don't have to worry about kids going home from school um, because we know online learning can be just as good. Um, a sort of, to me, I feel like there's been a second stream of research that came 
after 2010. So you do this meta-analysis in 2010. There's lots of randomized controlled trials. As you point out in the book, many of them happen in medicine. Few of them happen in K6. Um, A number of them are sort of scattered six through 12 um, and and in different parts of higher education. But then since 2010, um, there's just this like surge of online learning. There there are many, many more people, uh, you know, one source of that surge Mm -hmm. is massive open online courses, but community colleges are offering way more of these courses. Virtual schools are growing across the country. Um, And so I feel like between 2010 and 2020, there's sort of another wave of studies which are typically not experimental. They're typically observational. So so learning online mostly focuses on randomized controlled trials where there's some effort to control the difference between the people in the face-to-face condition and the people in the online or blended condition. Um, And um, there's a guy who is a community college researcher in, uh, in California who in 2011 published an article in which he described the online penalty. Um, which when he looked at this observational data from the California um, community college system, he said, actually, you know, we're seeing that when people take online courses, their outcomes are a little bit worse than face-to-face. And that's a bit of a problem. But the real problem is that for our Latin American students, our Latino, Latina students, um, the outcomes are substantially worse online than face-to-face. We found um, similar kinds of things when we looked at massive open online courses that people who Uh we looked, we found it globally. We found that people who came from countries with low levels of human development index, you know, less education, less healthcare, less GDP, things like that, um, passed courses at lower rates um, than folks from more affluent countries, even controlling for a level of education and things like that. Um, uh, Susan Dynarski looked at Uh a bunch of these kinds of studies and had an article in the New York Times um, which says online learning is hurting the students it's most supposed to help. That basically there's, you know, that, that, that Ray Kopp was kind of onto something with this idea of an online penalty um, that for a lot of people, when you switch from, it seems like when you look at these things, not experimentally, but observationally, when, when you send tens of thousands of people into a community college system and watch what happens to them, um, that they do a little bit worse in online learning um, in general, um, but particularly people with low prior achievement, people who weren't well served by the education system, people from racial minorities, people from lower class backgrounds, sometimes younger learners versus older learners, they do worse in online learning. Um, and to me, the, the sort of summary from that is a little bit different from learning online. I mean, the, the summary that I took away from meta, the meta analysis and learning online is we can make online learning that's just as good as face-to-face learning. We can make blended learning that's maybe a little bit better. Whereas, you know, I think this the second body of research points more in the direction of, boy, we ought to be pretty cautious when we do this online and blended learning stuff because there seems to be a population that when we do a lot of it is not well served. Um, and I, I'm wondering how you yeah. reconcile yeah. that. Well, actually, there is a chapter in Learning Online, which is... Um, learning for less prepared students, which Mm -hmm. actually takes up exactly this issue. And even at that time, by 2014, there were a number of studies coming out of the Community College Research Center analyzing data from large systems like uh, Virginia and Colorado. I'm sorry, yeah. Washington State. State. The the, the Teachers Colleges Community College Research Center, which has done some really terrific work over the years. Yeah. And and showing that um, there there were uh, lower course pass rates and lower grades in online versions of courses for uh, low income students and um, uh, students of color. And I I Anyway, that so the book does take that up, and that is my argument is that was a critique of the kind of online learning um, that was offered, uh, and it was a critique of online as opposed to blended learning. That's partly why the book comes out uh, much more strongly in favor of blended learning. I, I do think this does point up that as researchers, We really need to disaggregate our data and look for important student groups, not just look at the average overall. I I see it as kind of similar to the MOOC phenomenon you describe in your book, where we know that for some people, MOOCs are fabulous. They learn a lot of things, they do really well, but we also know most of the people that are participating in them, in fact, already have a bachelor's degree. So MOOCs are not gonna be the answer to 
bringing undergraduate education to everybody. Uh, it's it helps, uh, you know, as you say, it helps the rich get richer. Is is it fair to say that a bunch of the you know all most of the studies that we have, these sort of randomized control trials pre-2010 just weren't big enough to do a lot of that disaggregation, that that most of them don't attend to issues of race, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, may, e- either because they were too small or even some of the ones that were bigger, you know, I, I haven't gone through them all systematically, mm-hmm. but it just seemed like that question of how do people from different backgrounds and different life circumstances use technology differently um, is one that has been taken up much more robustly in the last 10 years looking at online learning than in the years before that? How, how fair of a characterization do you think that is? I think that's very fair. I would agree with that. And you do, you know, you do need the really large numbers in order to look at some of these issues and have appropriate controls for other variables. And of course, the mess of the really large numbers um, is that a lot of these things are not experimental. Um, so mm-hmm. a lot of the research that the Community College Research Center does, which is, ex- you know, it's it's excellent in the sense it's like, here's the entire state of Washington for two or three years. Right. Um, but those students were not randomly assigned to be in the online condition or in the face-to-face learning condition or any other condition. They're just people who signed up for their courses, whereas a lot of the research that you focus on in your meta-analysis is experimental. So there's it's like there's a strength of each of these bodies mm-hmm. of research um, that that they point in in somewhat different directions, um, and and part of that might be the nature of their designs. Right, right. I think part of that is the nature of their designs, and there's also the issue um, that many many of the things that can affect your learning online correlate with each other. Yep. In our in our um, survey this spring. Um, one of the things we found when we looked at the different challenges students reporting and countering, um, the number of those challenges and the severity of them um, was greater for some kinds of students than for others. So, and particularly students that were from lower income households and um, students who were uh, Latinx in particular, Um, had more challenges. They were more likely, for example, to be responsible for taking care of children during this period. Uh, Childcare is something that I've been thinking a lot about um, in online learning, because one of the things that online learning researchers have become very interested is this idea of self-regulated learning. Um, This idea that there are a set of practices that are good practices to have you be an effective, independent online learner that you can set schedules, that you can hold yourself to deadlines, that you can have goals, um, that you can go back and review materials when you need to. There's sort of a series of things, you know, some of which we can like abstract out from the learning logs that people leave in online systems. Um, Like, look, this person always shows up at the same time week after week, or look, this person, um, when they get things wrong, they go back earlier in the course. Um, And those, and and I think a lot of learning scientists, particularly those with kind of like a psychologist bent, have thought of those things as traits of individuals. Mm -hmm. Um, We did this study of of people who were taking a a massive open online course based blended um, supply chain management degree at MIT. And one of the things that struck us was that the men persisted a little bit more than the women. And -hmm. when we were talking to the men about how they got through this class, you know, they said things like, well, I stay late at work. I work, uh, I find some time on the weekends. Um, I, mm-hmm. uh, I take my lunch breaks off. And some mm-hmm. of that is like, oh, that's really good self-regulated learning. That's really good sort of setting these strategies. It is also shirking family responsibilities. Like I was way of describing those same characteristics is that I'm, I'm not meeting the responsibilities that I have to my family and my community. And in, in most cultures, men can do that more easily than right. women. This sort of right. regulated learning, not so much a trait, but a, but a condition, you know, um, mm-hmm. that, that there's, you know, that we can't, that, that, that if you, that if, to bring it back to this group of folks that you're studying, um, there's maybe a little bit of instruction of guidance that we can give to low-income Latinx students about how to balance childcare responsibilities with learning. Um, but it's not a thing that you can like fix someone's self-regulated learning traits and have be better. You have to fix the conditions under which they're learning. Like society needs better childcare um, right, to be able right. to make these things more equitable. Um, yeah, no, I totally agree. I think uh, one of the things you we need to be more aware of is what conditions people are learning under and 
some of the uh, things we heard about from students during the COVID this spring really pointed to things that were actually inequities that existed before. Long before, yep. That is, so it may be that there was a computer lab at school, but if you have to arrange to be at school extra hours to use the computer and the internet there, you are at a disadvantage to the student who has a great connection at home and their own laptop. And those things are happening before. It, we just happened to become much more aware of them this spring. We became, we became much more aware of them, even as they were getting worse. Because those exact same populations that you're talking about, um, you know, low income, Latino, um, black students, those were also the same students who are living in communities more likely to be disproportionately affected by COVID, less health care, more likely to be affected by the recession. Um, they're sort of within educational system factors and beyond educational system factors. Um, my my colleague, uh, Tressie McMillan Cottom, who's a great sociologist of higher education, she was talking about K-12 schools when she talked about this online, but she said, look, we have just dramatically underestimated the power of the building, um, mm -hmm. the building that brings people into the same space to be in the same conditions with one another. Um, you know, like, the, you know, there's there are a lot of really affluent people in college. There's a lot of much less affluent people in college. And they all sitting up end up sitting in the same crappy desks that are bolted to the floor right, in the right. <laughs> auditorium. And yeah. there is a meaningful equalizing function um, yeah. of that yeah. building that, right. that that we miss. That's right. One thing I took away from the beginning, the introduction to learning online is an argument um, that to analyze technologies, there's a lot of particularities to it. Um, like it's a particular technology in a particular subject area um, in a in a particular domain. Um, and uh, and I thought hard about that as I was writing Failure to Disrupt because I think very highly of your work and I decided to do something different, which is to say, eh, for a lot of technologies, there's basically three types of them. Um, there's these instructor guided courses like Massive Open Online Courses where an instructor sort of sets the pace of things. Um, they're algorithm guided tools like adaptive tutors and there are these peer guided networks. Um, and so I was curious to get your and the and the reason why those thing why those categories are useful is that new technologies are not new. Um, education technology venture capitalists will come and tell you that they've built the brandiest new thing ever. Um, and if you ask a couple of questions and if you know something about this ed tech history, you can go, oh no no no, that's just an adaptive tutor. Like we know those things kind of work in math and they don't really work that well in reading. They you know there's certain things they do in early language acquisition, but not in later language acquisition. So I can make a good guess about how your new brandy new thing works, because I know a little bit about the past mm -hmm. um, and can put it in this classification. Um, and I was wondering if when you read Failure to Disrupt, you thought to yourself, oh, these seem like three reasonable classifications and this is working. Or if you thought to yourself, no, 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 things are much more granular and much more complicated than this, um, that, there, that there's some things that readers are going to miss if they only look at large scale learning technologies through these three categories. Well, I actually liked your three categories. Um, I think the idea of who is who is controlling the content seems like a really important one to me. But I still would also go back to the complexity of this because I do think the nature of what you're trying to learn is also important. Mm -hmm. So whether it is a skill where a lot of practice is necessary just to fine tune that skill, even though you may know all the definitions, you may know all the concepts, but that doesn't mean you can execute it correctly. If you've ever had a spouse try to coach you on how to ski, yep. you know what I'm talking about. Like teaching my own kids is where I get, I've, I've pretty much retired now from teaching children to ski and I've just told them they need to take lessons from somebody who's not me. Um. So, you know, that's, that's one thing. On the other hand, if you're trying to um, hone your understanding of a historical period or a historical phenomenon. I, I think when you talk about um, having the more collaborative peer discussion based dialogue back and forth um, becomes more pertinent as opposed to building, um, you know, building uh, 
model-based learning where you're trying to really understand a model or a system in which like case, people often do in physics or chemistry in or, physics or chemistry in which case you know yet uh, something else starts to make sense so I I do think it's important what the subject matter is um, and also the nature of the learners we've talked a little bit about less prepared learners coming in mm -hmm. um, and less prepared learners who may be less confident I think that's part of the reason that having uh, guidance from a, a person, uh, you know, an instructor whom I know as a person who is sending the message, I believe you can learn this and I'm going to help you do it. And we're going to do it together till you yep. get there is really, really important for some students. Uh, whereas other students are just fine. Get out of my way. Let me let me Just look at the stuff. material. I'll get on Coursera. I'll be fine. Goodbye. Okay. Yeah, that's that. That's absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, I think a real challenge of people working in education technology who are both trying to do really rigorous research, but also trying to give advice that's useful to the public, is you sort of have to go between these levels of what's a pretty good summary, a pretty good heuristic, mm -hmm. um, a pretty good thinking guideline, and then what's all the complexity of a particular circumstance. Um, because, it, because if you just give people all of the complexity, um, it's, it's too much. It's too much to make all mm -hmm. the many decisions that people need to make. Um, or you want to take the first pass screening, like, you know, is this technology someone's introducing me to, like, reasonable to do the extra work to thinking about under all that complexity? Um, you know, and I think some of the things that, that your work, Learning Online, have helped me really think through is what are the ways that we can respect all that complexity, but also come up with some general guidelines for people that are like pretty good first approximations of all that complexity um, and, and can can help people think through that. And I think that's something that people have you know appreciated about your work is being able to sort of try to balance uh, both of those things. Well, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I want to return the compliment. I actually enjoyed Failure to Disrupt quite a bit. And uh, partly the your voice came through uh, what I think is a justified skepticism about overpromising with technology came through and a uh, sense of the importance of not just thinking about of technology as one unitary thing or the only thing that's ha that's happening uh, in our work recently. We've really emphasized the what we call the implementation model, mm. what actually gets implemented. And the technology is only one piece of that. The very same piece of software can be used in very different ways with very different effects. And what are what are other common pieces of the implementation model? When, when well, people have implementation model in their head, what other kinds of things should should they start thinking about? Well, one of the things uh, you know, one of the things is just simply deciding how you know how much of what parts of the course are students learning with digital tools and what part are with the instructor? How much of it is collaborative? How much of it is interactive? Are there, are there group projects? How, how often are you doing assessment? And are there assessments that are just for learning rather than counting towards your grade? So some of those things are things that are built into the way the course gets implemented, um, hopefully by design in a very thoughtful way. Sometimes it's more ad hoc. Uh, and those are things we see as having a big effect in concert with the use of a particular technology tool. I mean, one of the things I really liked about your book was the concept of getting better through tinkering. Um, I've actually used that metaphor before myself, so maybe that's part of why I, I like it. Is so the way we see with what we're doing now with... Uh, instructors is, these are instructors that really want to improve their teaching and learning. And they know it's going to take multiple changes and it's not going to be perfect the first time. And what we try to help them do is collect kinds of data and analyze the data in a way that helps them see, okay, these things seem to be a step in the right direction. These others, it seemed like a good idea, but oh my gosh, you know, the students hated it or they didn't use it. Or, or uh, they were confused by it. Well, Barbara, I think that's a great place to end our conversation, asking people just to continue to think about, you know, where does the technology fit in what you describe as the implementation model in the broader context? How does it work not to sort of sweep away the past, 
um, but to sort of iteratively, step by step, tinker by tinker, um, make our way to something better and something more robust for the future. So Barbara, thanks so much for joining us on Teach Lab. Oh, well, thank you, Justin. It was really a pleasure. That was Barbara Means. She's a learning scientist and education psychologist and the executive director of learning science research at Digital Promise Global. I hope you enjoyed our conversation where we talked about COVID-19, its effect on students, how it differentially affects different students, and then being able to step back to one of her real signature uh, works, Learning Online, which we'll link to in the show notes and make some comparison to, to Failure to Disrupt, which was published by me just more recently. Um, I'm Justin Reich. Thanks for listening to Teach Lab. Please subscribe to Teach Lab to get future episodes on how educators from all walks of life are tackling distance learning during COVID-19. If you're enjoying the show, go ahead and leave us a review um, or, or give us a five-star rating um, on your favorite podcast app. Um, I've also just released a new book, Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education, available from booksellers everywhere. You can read reviews, related media, uh, sign up for online events at failuretodisrupt.com. That's failuretodisrupt.com. This episode of Teach Lab was produced by Amy Corrigan and Garrett Beasley, recorded and sound mixed by Garrett Beasley. Stay safe until next time. <laughs>